Please join me in welcoming Mr. Young. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oroville. I flew in this morning from uh, New York uh, and was in Washington, D.C. before that. I was advising the president on uh, negotiations over uh, North Korea. Uh, and then I woke up. I remember when I landed this morning and was in the bathroom getting ready and my wife was helping me. And before I left out of the bathroom, I was just standing there staring in the mirror. I was stuck staring in the mirror because I couldn't remember why I was there. Remembering that thing is called purpose, ladies and gentlemen. And what we often forget most of the time, importantly, is the purpose for which we came into the room. One of the things that is most prevalent is when you've been in the room longer, you forget more often. And so when I give teacher in-service training, as I do often around the country, I often find those instructors with the most tenure as being the ones who forget most often. There is some correlation between being in a position so long you don't remember the essence, the heart and the soul for why you are there. You are not just those titles you hold, you are servants. If anybody feels a little put down by that, just remember that the greatest of you will be a servant. My mother was a very smart kid, but in her family she was the oldest. And when her mother became deathly ill, it was the protocol in the family that the oldest has to quit school. And so my mother, when we came to Los Angeles, took on the only job she could take on. Without education, she became a maid. That woman who was a maid realized that if she was going to make life different for her children and for herself, she would have to change something. She would have to go through a transformation Ladies and gentlemen, think about it seriously. In this country and in the world, there aren't many things that help to transform our lives. Yes, you can hit the lottery, but the chances of that are so remote. Don't bank on it. Education is the key to changing lives, not only in this country, but around the world. She went back to school at night at Jordan High School in South Central LA. Got her high school diploma there, but she didn't stop. She said, I want to go to college. And so she went on to LA Trade Technical College, a community college in Los Angeles. And she got her nursing license and went on to fashion a 20 year career in the medical profession. The 1954 Supreme Court decision that ended discrimination in higher education. Remember that was landmark. It took place in the arena of education because education is a powerful tool. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful tool which you can use to change the world. I am not speaking in lofty terms, ladies and gentlemen, when I say that what you hold in your hand as a gatekeeper is access to gold. Education, higher education in particular, represents the hopes and the dreams of people who in many cases have risked their lives to get what you have. They are all coming to college for one reason, to see you and you. And yes, you. And why are they coming to see you? Because you have something that they need. You are a gatekeeper. By definition, you hold something of value that these young students come to you to get. If you think about the movie The Wizard of Oz, you think about Dorothy lost. The, 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 the window frame hits her upside the head and she passes out. She doesn't know she's dreaming. She goes up into this twister and she lands where? In the land of Oz. And she's lost. 
and she's trying to find her way home. Those who come to you, not unlike Dorothy, are trying to find their way home. If home means literally that higher paying job so that they can have quality of life to take care of the family, then that's home. If home is to discover their purpose in life, then that is home, but they come to you to find their way home. I was in South Africa in, in 2008 uh, for Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday, and I had the pleasure of teaching at a school in Soweto. And while I was there at the school, I was able to work with students, there were about 70 of them in one room, and it was about English literature. And I told them, all right, the next assignment is a reading assignment, and what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for all of you to bring out your books, go to page whatever it was, and let's begin to read that chapter. And what they did was they all began to get up and rush towards the front of the room, scared me a little bit. And then one of the other teachers in the room said, Mr. Young, forgive them, they're going to the book. I said, what book? She said, the only book in the room. And they all gathered around this one book with these tattered pages, and they all wanted the chance to read not a paragraph, not a sentence, three words. And then the next person, three words, three words. The hunger was so deep that they all begged me to bring them back to America so that they could go to college here. And when I pressed one of the students, what makes you think that that is the answer for you? She says, your colleges are life to us. Don't your students feel the same way? I was in Oklahoma, and I will not out the name of the college, but a very well-known college down there, and I was doing professor in-service training. This was two years ago. And I was talking to a group of distinguished professors, and I spoke to them for about two hours with question and answers and all of that. And I remember coming back to Los Angeles and getting a series of emails from one of the longest tenured professors who CC'd the president of the college with all of the emails that were sent to me. And what the professor said simply is, how dare you come here and tell me how to teach my students? I am a professor of history and anthropology. I have a master's degree in psychology. I understand students. Let me tell you, Mr. Young, what my purpose is. It's not to hold their hands. It is to disseminate information, which they need. And once they have the information, it is up to them to do something with it. And then he signed off with all of his degrees behind his name, <laughs> which were well earned, by the way. But the point was this, and I mentioned this as a model tonight. That thought is so prevalent in higher education, and it's not just professors. There are people in your position as well who feel that as a gatekeeper, you have this goal, but it is up to the student to come and get it and cry it out of my unopened hands. It gives you a sense of power feeling that way. It gives this professor a sense of power by saying what he said. And so I challenged him with all due respect to the man that he was and the fact that he took the time to write me so many emails. And I said, here's the challenge. And I'd like to offer it to you today. I said, what is it that you say that you do? He said, I disseminate information. It's their job to get it and to do whatever they're supposed to do with it. That's why I'm here. I said, oh, you are an information disseminator. I get it. We're holding interviews to replace you. And our leading candidate is here. <laughs> Upon interviewing this new candidate, this upstart candidate, we realize that it can disseminate a million times more information than you can. candidate has said it will work for free. All we have to do is to plug it in and charge the battery every now and then. No bathroom break. No holiday break. No raise. 
Doesn't need an office. Doesn't need a staff. All it says is push my button, I'll tell you whatever you need. If the whole purpose is simply disseminating information, how many of you can remember the teacher who inspired you the most in school? Can you, you who, who was that teacher? Oh, I had a wonderful history professor. What was the name? His name was, uh, <laughs> well, I had two. Earl Pullius was one. Yeah. But, uh, he was at USC. At USC, USC, my alma mater. Good man. Now, why do you remember him in that way? He called Saint Sangay. He was oh, undergraduate. Which speaks for itself. But what was it about this man that makes you recall his name now? He told engaging stories and involved me in the process of learning. Yes, he brought you in. He cared about you. He inspired. Somebody else, come on. You, you, somebody has to have a teacher here, a coach. Where at? Oh, you OP. Oh, she's in the room. She speaks about her mentor in the room. Not to embarrass her, but why would you call her out now? Hmm. I went to USC. Is USC represented in the house? Trojans. Yeah. Do we have time for the fight song? <laughs> we'll we'll give UCLA, UCLA equal time later. But <laughs> yes, Miss Smithrow, my tenth grade English teacher. She believed in me. Oh, look at how he said the name. It still means something to him. Think about what they just said. And let me add to that name, Mr. Paul C. McMorris. Lock High School. And while it wasn't higher education, Mr. Paul C. McMorris was what we considered our first Vice President of Student Affairs at Lock High School. That wasn't his official title. His official title was janitor. Yeah. Mr. McMorris cared about every student at that school. When he spoke about us, he said, these are my kids. When he talked about the time we was there, he'd say, not on my watch. He owned it. It was his school, not the buildings, not the brick and the mortar and the glass. Mr. McMorris said, these are my kids. When the Crips gang began to rise up while I was in high school and threatened to come to Lock High School, Mr. McMorris got on his little Jeep and he went around and he chained up all the gates. And he got a bat from his home. And while it was a little over the top, <laughs> Mr. McMorris sent a message to the rest of us. He told us, you all go back to school. You go and go into your classes and don't you worry about a thing. Mr. Mack is on duty. Mr. Mack passed away two years ago and he had the biggest funeral of any administrator, any counselor, any teacher, anybody we ever knew in South Central LA. They had to have three sessions for this man's funeral. They came because they loved him. They came because he believed in them. They came because he said, not on my watch. A computer can spit out all the data it wants, but it can never hug a child. It can never say, not on my watch. It can never say, go back safely to the classroom. I've got it. Mr. Mack is on duty. You have to work with your staff to understand, to make sure that they understand that they are all part of this team, from the receptionist and the secretary to whoever sits outside your door. They have to understand that this is a team effort or it fails. I wish you absolute joy. I wish you nothing but success in the next few days. But more importantly, I just am so excited about what's gonna happen when you go back to your schools and your students see the new energized you, the new invigorated you, the choir member who went back and read the words to the song again. <laughs>